Please be seated. Um, this is a time scheduled for oral <laughs> argument in our case number 1CAJV 150134. Kimberly J. V. Jareem R. and B. R. If I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, each side has been allocated 20 minutes for oral argument. The appellant, um, you get a chance for rebuttal. Uh, there's a clock in the podium. The clock, there's a, it'll show you how much time you have left, including your rebuttal time. So if you want to reserve five minutes for rebuttal and the clock shows there's only two minutes left, you only have two minutes for rebuttal. You have to manage your own time. Um, appellee doesn't get a chance for rebuttal. Um, the, to, to assist you, you should be aware that we have um, reviewed the record in this case, reviewed the briefs, reviewed the case law, and have conferenced it. So we're relatively familiar with the facts and the issues on appeal. Um, while you've been given, so use your time advisedly, given that um, if there's no requirement that you have to use all your 20 minutes, if you uh, have nothing else to say and we don't have any further questions, feel free to sit down. Um, finally, you should be aware that we are recording these proceedings, both the audio recording and video recording. So when you step up to the podium, please first identify yourself and who you're representing and be aware that you are on camera. And I think it's like several weeks after oral argument, it shows up on YouTube. You can actually find it. Only a couple of days. Only a couple of days. So, so with that, smile for the camera. Um, so, uh, uh, counsel for the appellant, are you step forward. Start. May it please the court, my name is Keith Berkshire, attorney for the appellant, Kimberly J. The issue before you on what the requirements of a guardian ad has to do under Rule 40, 40.1, or 40 and 40.1 hasn't been addressed by this court. We contend that there are various cases by this court and by the Supreme Court that have dealt with the issues similarly enough that this case would require reversal. There's no real question in this case what the court did by not requiring the guardian ad litem to meet with the child or submit a position statement is error. It, uh, aptly so much as concedes that in their brief. The issue is what happens once we find that that error existed. To begin, what my client is asking for is not a finding that the termination go forward as far as that this court terminate father's rights or that there were sufficient grounds. She simply wants a trial on the issues, including a guardian litem that, for lack of better phrasing, does their job under the rules. Well, let me ask you this, Mr. Berkshire. So. Let's assume then that the guardian ad litem did not comply with Rule 40.1D. Um, are you suggesting that the failure to comply with that rule resulted in a lack of sufficient evidence for the court to find that um, the termination was not in the best interest of the child? I think that it, it, it could have, Judge. I think that we potentially just don't know. It becomes a due process concern whether the child's voice was heard. In the Supreme Court case, the juvenile case, 500274, I love referring to numbers, it makes it more difficult. The Supreme Court, at the very last paragraph of that case, stated that because the, chi because the parents' interests obviously differ in a termination action, that the Supreme Court stated, it's in the future we strongly recommend that the child appoint an independent, the court appoint independent counsel for the child to represent the child's interest in the termination. And how and, old was this child? At the time of the termination, I can't remember um, because, well, then. well, it depends when when you're talking about. The termination took about three years from, um, which is an issue we didn't raise on appeal, but when you had hearings spread apart, nine, ten months apart. Um, but, you know. but don't you agree that um, the trial court has discretion as to whether appoint independent counsel for the child and that independent counsel really only needs to be appointed when there's a conflict uh, between the child's position on the termination and what might be in the child's best interest. The, I, I don't believe that's the situation. The, the Supreme Court has held and this court has held 
uh, additionally that the the conflict that why the child's voice, voice is important, the conflict is between the two parties' interests, not between the child and one of the parties. It's, be, the, it's the, between the two parties, why the child needs an independent voice. And that's the basis of the rules, of both, of both rules in the context this court needs to look at it, which is the child's input. And the child can have input into multiple things. They can have input into the final result, but they, more importantly, they can have input into the actual factual background. Did the did in this case did dad exercise parenting time? D was there abandonment? The child can have input into that, and one of the reasons the guardian litem is required to meet with them prior to hearings, if the child if they ask the child, did you meet with dad on this day? Did you do these things? The child's like I, I haven't seen him in a year. Then it allows the guardian litem to do their job and question the the parent or have the child interviewed about those specific things. It's but the that reason wasn't for- that was the case here, right? I mean, it, it what, what the, the, evidence, the evidence that was presented showed that um, when the father was visiting the child, the notes indicated that the child was happy, that, uh, that they believed that the child loved the father. Uh, and that, that, and so the question for me is, okay, let the, so let's say the guardian ad litem didn't meet with the child, didn't report, which the record seems to support. Okay, but, what is the consequence of that? I mean, I think we need to look at the potential consequence there. So if, in fact, it was a year, if you had a child um, who could give um, meaningful input and be able to say, well, I saw my dad on this day and I saw my dad on that day, um, then you might have a different situation because then it goes, it might go to whether there was sufficient evidence um, on best interests. But here, the court, it's a very different factual situation than you just suggested. Here the court had a lot of evidence that the child had a good relationship with the father. Well, one of the factors, which is the second issue we brought up in our appeal, was that most of the evidence you're talking about, the supervised visits, which at parenting skills resulted in the reports and so forth, was after the fact of the filing, which we believe under the current case law shouldn't be considered as dispositive because otherwise every abandonment case would be uh, precluded, the statute would be meaningless. But our issue on that is, it, you, is what type of error analysis you're looking at, Judge. If you, you're looking at something wh whether there was a factual dispute, we don't know potentially on some of that because the child's position wasn't ever taken. That is a key issue. It's the same as saying, well, what if only one of the parents testified? The same token that we could have significant evidence on the record if only one parent testified or if one parent was denied the right to testify. We could still have sufficient evidence. Here, it is a requirement. It's a shall, it's a shall requirement and the, uh, under two separate rules. And once you appoint a guardian ad litem, we're not asking that independent counsel be appointed. We're asking, I'm just using that case for context. We're stating that once they are appointed, they have to do their job. And there was a large factual dispute, which is mo most of the testimony was about of the involvement of father. And the child is the third party there, the, really one of the only parties that knows whether there was the involvement, whether there was a relationship. And the child's... So this was fairly important to your client, in other words, to have some input from the GAL um, that might have shed light on <clears throat> The fact, any factual dispute, is that what you're saying? I think it could have been a, a key factor, and I'm assuming this goes into a waiver argument. Um, yes, if you're following me, why wasn't, why didn't someone say, judge, wait a second? Well, and I think that th this gets into two, the, the issue under the Henderson case, Stavey Henderson, about whether you objected or not, whether it's a harmless error analysis or a fundamental error, error analysis. Realistically, it's a combination of both, depending on each violation of the guardian litem. I would agree that in the multitude of initial hearings, prior to the final hearing, that it would be looked at probably as a fundamental error analysis because they didn't object, and my, my client's trial counsel didn't object at all those initial hearings where it was an absolute requirement. So we'd agree that those are probably would be under a fundamental error analysis because there was no objection. But at the end of the day, the last thing at the transcript was, I am going to submit my report. Here is my timeline. They didn't do it. When was my client supposed to object? And I'd remind the court, juvenile rules, unlike civil and family and every other type of rule, they don't have a motion for new trial. There's no time extending motion to file an appeal. So how do we do it? If you can't file a motion for new trial and say you didn't do this and put an objection down, you wouldn't have preserved your right for an appeal. So they could theoretically have filed some post-decree motion that really isn't allowed in the rule and hope that the 
um, that the trial court did something, but then they wouldn't have extended their you know limited, extremely limited time frame to file a juvenile appeal um, to, to do anything. So the could, the could, waiver could, argument couldn't you have moved to set aside the judgment? The not juvenile court rule forty six e that allows you to set aside and point out that the, you never heard from the, the GAO? I think it's a, it could be a separate option, but again, as you know, there's no absolute requirement that we do that. There's, I mean, this is a- but, but it does give the trial judge then a chance to say, oh yeah, I never heard from the GAL. And well, now that, we're sort of stuck with the idea of, well, we don't know what the GAL would have said, and the trial judge never had really a chance of someone reminding a busy trial judge, gee, we never heard from the GAL, vacate it and let's hear from her. And, and uh, I'd agree that, that that is a procedural possibility, but I don't think it's an absolute requirement to bring up the error. Okay. And so the, the issue is whether there was the error and what's the context, what's the um, repercussion. Our position is that the case that's the most similar on point, because there is no rule that's interpreting this. There's rules about, there's cases about not in, in um, appointing one. We've got the Supreme Court case, the Juvenile 3824 case, where they didn't, uh, didn't appoint one or the person didn't essentially do their job. And the Supreme Court says the duty of the court is to protect the interest of the asserted incompetent in that case, but it's the same rule for uh, protect the interest of the child. Mm -hmm. And so forth, we say, we think that that's probably the closest case on on point. You got the Pima County appeal, uh, 828, that talked about, um, you know, that they a GAL was required, um, and could it be the same as the, their attorney? Again, it was an incompetence case. Um, could it be the same um, person as the attorney? What the, the court did in that case was just a, the GAL being appointed and doing their job is the requirement not the rule didn't require that it be two separate parties an attorney and a, a separate guardian and litem for the person did the and you can refresh my recollection on the record there was a change in the gal the gal died the GA, first gal died first gal died when was the second GAL? do a second gal appointed after the after the, after the evidentiary hearings it was appointed in the middle of the process of the evidentiary hearings because there was multiple days of evidentiary hearings spread right. out over significant time one of them was cut short because the judge and, decided to go to a cle in and, the afternoon right. and so but no one ever said well we want to hear from the gal before the trial the seven the evidentiary hearings are over because what you're talking about is gee maybe the, the child would have a different take on what the facts were and we could be, he could be he could be interviewed or by the judge or or a summary of his maybe even testify depending on his age, but um, and I, and I think no, that no one ever said well wait you know let's not close off the severance hearing the evidentiary hearings until we hear from the GAL. Well, it, no one did judge, and this is the the issue of why I think that each individual violation of the rule, and we count at least five separate ones, and if you include per hearing, it's probably closer to nine of that, yes, those first initial eight violations that they would have, you have an argument that they should have objected and those would go under the fundamental and error er analysis. But at the end, the GAL does stand up and say, I will talk to the child, I will do my report. And, the and parties have, agree. And may have, and just didn't have anything to report. Well, they didn't. Uh, I mean. But they, well, we, from the record, we, well, is, you there, don't, is there anything in the record that says the, child, that the GAL did not talk to the child? No, other than, I mean, again, that since the trial was over, we couldn't go, you know, add evidence in of, you know, my client's affidavit, who my client has the child, saying the GL never showed up. Right. Um, so I mean, the, that would have been. We're stuck with the record that we have. And, and in the record, there is absolutely no proof that the GAL met with the child or put forth the child's position. And I think one of the, one of the to go back to why the GAL's job is important, and this is, it, it almost rep represents this third party that the court has to look out for, not that it's just my client didn't do something or trial counsel didn't do something, that it's this third party was in the, there's a Yavapai um, juvenile case, 8545, where this court stated, you know, the standard uh, under the statute ensures that independent counsel will be appointed where there are conflicts of interest such that the child's best interests are fully explored, advocated, and included in the record. And I think the included in the record is a key part of that case. Here there is no, you know, position. Did the guardian ad litem do, you know, take test, you know, cross-examine witnesses and things in that case? Yeah, they did but they didn't do what is also mandated in the rule. This isn't a rule that says, hey, here's six things, 
five out of six is good enough, you know, and, and you know, you, you, you shoot an 85% and we're, and we're, and that satisfies the standard. The standard is, is an unequivocal shall present the child's position. And this, the juvenile statutes are full of this. We have Title 14 statutes where if you're going to do an adoption or, um, guardianships and the child's above a certain age, they're mandatory not only at the hearing, they're mandatory to take positions. The juvenile rules are full of that the child's interest, the child's position are to be taken in these hearings. And that's simply what we think did not occur because, again, the guardian lied at the end of the day at the final thing. If we're going to, at that final hearing, didn't do their job. And if we, the argument here under the Henderson case is if you object or don't, fundamental or harmless error, at least that one has to be looked at harmless error as, at as under a harmless error analysis where it's the the opposing party's side, most obviously the harmless error case is criminal, but the, where it's the opposing party's side to show that there's no possibility this would, would have changed. Now, um, Arizona your, your, does- Your client had the burden of proof, correct? Correct. And two separate ones and one of them for the statutory factor is clear and convincing. It's a high standard. But again, the child could have been a, uh, a, a fact issue. We don't know that the child's opinion and the child's opinion of the facts, what happened if the GAL did their job, would not have changed it. So and it, under a fundamental error analysis, it goes to the foundation of the case is the standard under Henderson and every juvenile case that's reached that. And this, the fundamental part of this case is, is there a relationship between the child and did at dad exercise times? These are two huge fundamental issues in the case that the GAL never put forward a position on whether, um, whether these were factually correct. Mm -hmm. And again, since there's two different, we, we outlined in our brief, you know, every single um, port of the rule that we, uh, we, we believe was error. But, it, it, you know, this is one of the few rules uh, where there's a repetitive rule. I mean, this isn't something that this is, you know, a footnote or a committee comment about what, what is important. This is the two counsel, separate the, rules. Does something strike you, strike you odd as your client has a burden of proof, very high burden of proof. Um, there's no GAL report provided. Your client never objects. There's a lot of evidence that the father was having contact with the child, which I know you don't agree with. And yet, you never bring this up, you never bring this evidence forward, you never make any objection in the trial court. And now on appeal, you want to raise this issue for the first time when it was your client who filed the petition, had the burden of proof, and said absolutely nothing about the absence of this report in the trial court record. Does something strike you odd about that as bringing it up on appeal for the first time? I, I definitely understand from the evidentiary standpoint, Judge. I mean, there's no way around it that you look at the, should they have put this on, should this have been of key evidence? And clearly, if they believe it's key evidence, that there's something to that. And my clients did believe it was key evidence. They did believe the GAL, from all the conversations that they had with the guardian ad litem, was going to fully support their position. And they believed that this final report on the positions was going to be a key piece of evidence. But until it's not submitted, you don't know it's not submitted. And if this is the last thing that's out there on the record, how do you object? Uh, There's I mean, no, I mean, is there anything in the record about what you just outlined, what your client believed and what she discussed with the GAL? Did she testify to that? Well, they really can't. I mean, they can't, you know, say, I can't get up there and say, the GAL told me they're going to do this. I mean, it's not, Why not? the GAL's not taking their positions. The GAL's asserting the child's. And so they're relying on the GAL to do their job at the end of the day, which is to put those positions forward. But there's and not even a proffer of what you think the GAL might have concluded or anything like that? There's not, because when could they when could they make it? If they think that if you're submitting a closing argument, you're submitting a final position, the GAL's gonna do this, they're gonna they're relying on this final report. But there was a deadline, right? For the GAL to submit the report. Correct. And the good line fail, passes, and then uh, that, yeah, that that would have triggered a judge. We need a we need a report, an objection from the or, or a motion from the from your clients, saying, Judge, we need the GAL report. The GAL hasn't submitted it. That would have triggered. That certainly would have triggered the probably court ordering the GAL to do something or the GAL doing something. Well, if you look at the procedural process of how these final um, closing arguments were to be done, they set absolute dates without reply. So, I mean, there's procedurally the court already set 
what you were to do. So filing something that wasn't, I mean, the court already said the only things they were going to finally allow. They didn't specifically say, I mean, it, it was something that was simply not anticipated that they wouldn't, they wouldn't do. And then. But it was important to your client. It, it, abs absolutely, it was it was key evidence. But it's also again, this also gets to the issue of it was important to the child. We can't. These cases are meant to protect the child's interest. And in the case, um, I think it's the Xavier case, um, where the court found that the rules didn't have to be followed because the child has a right to appeal and the guardian litem has a right to appeal. The the precipice of this is that it's the right of the child to be protected and the child's opinion to be heard. So whether my client objected or not. It's the, the GAL didn't do their job for the child, and that's what's really being appealed. The problem is there's no, I mean, the guardian of the item isn't going to appeal the, their own, their own um, fact they didn't do their job and say, hey, I didn't do my job, you know, overturn this. The court lacks sufficient evidence to protect the best interests of the child, given this record? I don't think that's the analysis. I, I think that, I don't think the analysis here um, it is that is that there's sufficient evidence, sufficient evidence on the record. I think it's a more strict liability standard of they didn't do it. I, I, I use that term loosely, but it's they didn't do their job. Much like much like the Supreme Court um, said in the uh, um, 3824 case, the simple fact that the guardian litem was not appoint, appointed is reversible error, and it's the, that's the standard that we believe should be used is. The simple fact, and in this case, the guardian litem. You're arguing like a structural error standard on this. I, I think it, to some extent that is the argument. I want to save my last 30 seconds. Well, we, we can, we can run it. Let's. You want we to have question some, that? We have, we have some questions. But I think so that you, that's the closest case on this, is the, is the Supreme Court analysis there. They simply said where they didn't, weren't appointed, it wasn't, that was the error itself, done. But in your reply brief, you say, I think I'm quoting it rightly. Without the GAL information, the juvenile court of the minor, minor child's position on termination, the juvenile court did not have sufficient evidence to deny mother's petition for termination. That seems to me to strike me as something different than it was just strict liability, in other words, sort of structural error. They didn't hear from the GAL. It's that well, because they didn't hear from the GAL, they didn't have sufficient evidence. There is a crossover between the two. I mean, there, there, def there is because the kid's position is this again. That's this third rail. That this is the input they need to make the decision, and it's the liability. Without this evidence, they can't go farther. So when we argue that in the opening brief that it's more of the strict standard, because uh, like the um, the three eight two four case, and the response was the reply brief was simply from the standpoint of you can't go forward without this position. It is evidence. I mean, is it? You know, worded as sufficiency of the evidence. You know, is that the the proper phrasing of it? it but it, it it's a key evidence that you just can't go without. Yeah. But I mean, is there any evidence in the record that would suggest that the child um, didn't have a good relationship with his father? That he didn't get along with his father at the visits? That was my client's position. That was the significant testimony about the lack of um, contact. Was your mother? Uh, I'm sorry. Was the mother at the visits? Well, no, Father. it was supervised. And again, that's we believe that the, the post-filing visits should not be the focus because the case law says that it's, you know, otherwise abandonment wouldn't ever be met. I have to say that I disagree that um, the post-petition uh, actions were the focus um, because the court emphasized that um, father had almost continual contact with the child since his birth. Um, and taking him from school on family vacations, outings, etc. So the court did not focus exclusively, and I'm not even sure primarily, on post-petition actions to support the findings that your client had not proved abandonment. They did when it focused on the relationship because they relied significantly on the reports from parenting skills, which is part of the minute entry. And they said the reports from parenting skills, the supervisor, which only occurred after yeah. service, was um, were key evidence towards the best interest finding. But I know I'm long over. I could keep going, but. Um, yeah. um, would you add one minute on both sides? We asked a lot of questions and used up your rebuttal time. All right. Thank um, you, Judge. So if you could add one minute on both sides. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Robert Rosanelli, and honorable justices, I represent the appellee, Jeremy, who's over here on the right in the red shirt behind me. 
Um, I like just, the promotion, but I don't think we're justices. Oh, th Either a promotion. <laughs> Especially a promotion me. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Promotion or we're justices of peace. You're, right, too. Yeah, yeah you're, you're somewhere in between, right? But you're more of a justice than I am. Uh, in any event, thank you. And, uh, you know, this case is about uh, abandonment and also the role of the GL and about waiver. Abandonment, I don't even really think we should even talk much about that. This is clearly not an abandonment case. The case law does not say, as counsel suggests, that we should discount or forget or just not even consider the post filing actions. After all, this case was filed in 2012. They went to court, they went in family court, they went in juvenile court. They stipulated at mediation conference to have weekly parenting skills visits. How could we, how could any juvenile court judge ignore three years of contact? Uh, and she didn't and she shouldn't. And, and it would be inappropriate to throw out all that contact. Uh, this clear case of abandonment. Abandonment, of course, is a real elastic concept, but it's based upon conduct. We've got years and years and years of conduct going back to when this child was just a little boy. Uh, the child, I believe, was nine at the last day of trial. I think the child is about 11 right now. Uh, this trial took over a year. Uh, there were three hearings. Uh, there was uh, there was Ms. Jennifer Perkowski was the first GL. Uh, she was appointed back in 2012. You know, with regard to the GL, um, Certainly the rule specifies those things the GL is supposed to do, and those rules are serious. Of course, as all juvenile court rules are serious. Uh, but we don't really, here, here's what we have. We have Ms. Perkowski appearing. She appeared, I think, at eight different conferences and trials in this case. Back to uh, June of 2012, August of 12, 9 of 12, February of 13, April 13, twice, November 13, and June of 14. And of course, then she passed away, apparently, uh, between June of 14 and July of 14 because Ms. Owsley was appointed the successor GAL, according to the record, uh, July 21 of 14. Then Ms. Owsley appeared at the last day of trial. Ms. Perkowski uh, participated in the first two days of trial. She was there. She acted as a GAL does at trial, which is akin to a lawyer. She examined witnesses. She did what she does. That's what we do, and that's what she did. Um, Owsley gets the case. Owsley does the same sort of thing at the last day of trial. The last day of trial, the transcript was about, well, I think it was somewhere around 100 pages of testimony, something like that. And Ms. Owsley cross-examined for about 15 or 20 pages of that. So she vigorously cross-examined witnesses. I think it was 75 pages of testimony. And she participated in, uh, you know, pages 38 to 42 and 62 to 70 of the last day of trial in June of 14. So she really did do her job accepting, of course, what happened at the end. And by the way, we don't know, so we don't know if Ms. Perkowski visited with the child in those two years she was on the case. We don't know. We don't know if she interviewed the child. We don't know if she went out and talked to mom. We have no idea. It's not in the record. And um, But she did have the case for all that time, took part in conferences about visitation, about scheduling, and then in the trial, first two days of trial. Now, when Alzi gets the case, she does what she does as a lawyer in the trial, acting as jail. And at the end, of course, the judge says, closing arguments, we all know. She says, I haven't been out to see the child yet. I'll get out there. I'll, I'll mention it uh, in my closing argument. And she says that. The court sets a deadline and for mom and dad to submit their closing arguments. And Ms. Owsley. Mom met her deadline. Dad met his deadline. And then Owsley didn't. So we don't know what she would have said. We don't know if she went out to see the child. We never will know that other than extra out-of-court statements here that you may have heard here today. Is there any case that, that we would, like, a lot of times we'll presume public officers mm -hmm. do their job, absent evidence to the contrary. Is there any case that seems to say if we, we will presume that a, that, a, that a GAL met with their client um, and, you know, and even if they didn't file a report? You know, not in Arizona. Uh, I do a lot of this work. I've never seen such a case in Arizona. And I don't know about the other states. Um, I have no idea about the other states. But, you know, there are presumptions, as you know, uh, presumptions that uh, when, when uh, courts, uh, lower courts don't make uh, specific findings, well, it's presumed that the finding would have been made, something like that. I but but I don't think, I don't know of anything here. The mental health cases where they presume that the attorney appointed to represent the patient actually met with the patient. You know, I don't know the, there's evidence to the contrary. I apologize. I don't know the mental health cases. I don't know, but not in the juvenile context. And I want to tell you, you asked before when this could have been raised, okay? Owsley missed her deadline, never did file anything. But what happened was mom filed a rebuttal argument. So mom files hers, dad files his. 
According to the index of record, uh, mother filed her closing argument December 19 of 14, father filed his January 16, then mom in index number 55 files a rebuttal to father's closing argument, February 20, 15. By then, mom would have seen Alzi missed her deadline. So when you ask, or when they say there was no time to do it, the case is over. We can't file anything, an un unauthorized motion, an unauthorized document. She filed a rebuttal document. Counsel, let me ask you a question. If mother had objected to the failure of the GAL to file a report and the court had overruled that objection, would you be urging us to reverse this case? <clears throat> would I? If the, if, the, if the mother objected and uh, the commissioner said, no, too bad. In other words, does this case just come down to a waiver argument? Well, it's if a... If a timely objection had been raised, would we have a problem? If a timely objection had been raised, then what the court commissioner should have done was say, hey, Ms. Owsley, get out there and see the child. Let's say the court doesn't do anything. Court ignores it or, or doesn't uh, uh, sustain the uphold the objection. In other words, how mm -hmm, important mm -hmm. is this requirement? How important is this rule? Well, the rules are important, but in my opinion, there's substantial compliance, number one. Number two, we don't know if she actually went out and saw the child, number two. Okay, she didn't file paperwork. I don't think that's important, okay? Uh, we're not re really required to file every motion known to mankind. We're not really required to take a, well, to file documents, but, uh, but she should have filed something. It would have been nice had she done it. We all wish she had done that. I'm sure we all in this courtroom wish she had done that. Um, but really my point is the juvenile court should have addressed it, and I suspect the juvenile court have, but we don't know. And, and so we don't know. You could be right. Perhaps the juvenile court would not have addressed it. If she'd raised the objection there, then there'd be a legitimate uh, error brought, you know, a claim of error before you today. Since the objection was not raised, then they've waived it. And there is a there is an interesting juvenile court case, a termination case, dealing with fundamental error and waiver and failure to object, and that's Monica C versus DES. And that's at 118 Pacific 3rd, 37, 211, Arizona 89. It's a 2005 termination of parental rights case. Well, in that case, the mom claimed she was severed, and the mom claimed that she was never told she could have a jury trial and was never given Form 3, which uh, in severance cases advises parents of their rights, the right to certain uh, trial rights, their, their need to come to court, and the consequences of their failure to do so. So she lost, and then she raised these things first time on appeal and said, you know, I was gypped. I didn't know I could have a jury trial. Well, the Court of Appeals, Division One, said uh, turned her down and said something pretty interesting, said that, Failure to comply with the Arizona Rules of Procedure for Juvenile Court does not necessarily require a reversal. And it says that uh, noncompliance with the rules does not mandate reversal. Uh, therefore, noncompliance cannot be termed structural error. And then it talks about harmless error and fundamental error. Procedural rules don't create substantive rights. So I understand how a court could mm -hmm. reach that conclusion. Just violating a rule doesn't equate right. to a due process violation. Right. Well, Is here, your primary argument waiver? I guess that's where I'm Absolutely, to... Your Honor. Okay. Absolutely. And I don't think that this is a fundamental error. So I think the the waiver, the uh, objection should have been made in the lower court. And it, it wasn't fundamental error in the uh, in the Monica C case for the uh, juvenile court and DES not to uh, give her Form 3 and not to advise her she had a jury trial. Apparently she wasn't advised. And they found not fundamental, didn't go to the heart of the case, didn't deprive her of a fair trial. And here, mom cannot really complain that she was deprived of a fair trial. They litigate for three years, two, three years, in family court and juvenile court. They have numerous court hearings, numerous motions. They dispute over discovery. They file a contempt action against Jeremy, my client. Uh, they, she litigated the heck out of this but, case. But yes, sir. I think the opposing counsel's argument isn't that she was denied a fair trial. Mm -hmm. It was that the child was denied a right to be heard. Well. You know, I, I understand that as well. I, I don't know if that's, I understand that as well. Um, the child had a legal representative there and two GALs, in fact, and they represented that child. Now, if they had something they wanted to tell the court, they had something they wanted to go off their mind, they wanted, if they wanted to express a firm position, I don't know if we can presume, but they didn't do it, okay, over two years, okay, and, and three days of trial. So there was a legal representative there. Um, and uh, I do think it's not a fundamental problem. I think the child it had a fair hearing. 
the evidence was fully presented. Dad presented his side, mom presented her side, GL actively participated in that. So all we don't have is the GL reporting to the court, this is how the child feels. That's what we don't have. But we don't know how the child feels. We don't know if that would have favored mom or favored dad, or if the child was ambivalent. We just don't know. We don't know if the GLs actually said to the child, what do you want me to tell the court? You know, when you represent children, you have to do it. It's not exactly the same as represent adults. You have to kind of do it gingerly, depending on the maturity, as you know, and the age of the child. So I don't know this child, don't know the maturity level, don't know how appropriate it is to say to the child, what do you want to do? Do you love your dad? Do you want to see your dad? I don't know. So we, we never will know that, and it could have been handled in the juvenile court. We don't really need, we shouldn't even really be here today, uh, it, rather than guess at what the child would have said, might have said, and guess what happened with Ms. Owsley. This could have all been resolved in the juvenile court. And trust me, the juvenile court could actually have threatened Ms. Owsley with contempt. It could have removed Ms. Owsley if that was appropriate to make sure that uh, that uh, something was done if something had to be done. So the juvenile court has all the power in the world to enforce those rules and get Ms. Owsley to file her paperwork. And that's where we, that's where this case should be, not before you all, okay? Uh, there's no reason to guess, to speculate, no reason to raise these things first time when it could have been resolved a long time ago. And that would have been fair for the child, fair to the parties. The case is supposed to have an expedited uh, status. Now it's not. It's a prolonged status case now because this was never raised. And they raised, they did file a rebuttal, a closing argument, and they waived it. They never raised it. And I don't know why they didn't. Um, really, that's about all I have to say unless you, you justice judges have questions of me. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, for, for my one minute, the Monica C case does exactly explain the issue that I was talking about, the fundamental versus harmless error. It cites to Henderson, which is what I was discussing before. And it, it, at the end of the day, this does come down to exactly what just, Judge Kessler just stated. Is the, is the child's opinion important? And what if this was the opposite way? What if the dad's rights had been terminated? Would it be key then? And if it would have been key then, then we've got an equal protection under the law argument. Because my belief is if, the, if dad's rights would have been terminated without a GAL, whether dad objected or not, the court would find it as a key issue. Because this is still the rights of the child. This is the rights of him. And the fact that Again, whether my client objected or not, this is protecting the child's interest. And in Xavier, when the court allowed an appeal based just on the guardian litem, it was about the child's interests here. The fact that they attended 8, 10, 12 hearings with never doing their job should be looked at harshly as well. They, there's nothing in the record that this guardian litem ever met with the child, ever did what their main requirement was, which was to advocate for the child. The child was 11 at the time this case ended. They could surely you know, tell a position. I had an 11 year old, they, they're, they're not quiet. Probably have opinions. They have an opinion. They could have said what happened during the course of this case. And one of the other items here. Let me here, just stop right there because the, isn't the job of the GAL not to advocate for the child, but to advocate for the child's best interest. That's why sometimes we appoint lawyers for the child because the child's best interest may conflict with what the child wants. So her job is not to advocate for the child. Her, ch her job is to advocate for the child's best interest. Which is why there's a requirement they actually have to meet them. Because how can you advocate for somebody's interest that you've never met, never talked to, never found their, what affects them when you've never done it? How can you possibly do that job? Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Um, Thank both counsel for their uh, briefs and their oral arguments. We will take this matter under advisement and issue a written decision in due course. Uh, with that, we stand adjourned.